Okay, welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Um, <clears throat> it's a tough, tough act to follow the wine, but this is a different thing. This will also be a memorable 10 minute session, I promise, but not quite as cheerful or joyous <laughs> as the wine. So, my name is Stephen Fine. I attended RSI in 1989, where I, where I infamously sneaked out one night to go, to go to a Who concert. Some people may have heard that story. Um, <laughs> I, I interject humor wherever possible. I promise, though, it's short and sweet, this presentation. Um, ever since the last RSI reunion several years ago, come on in. I've wanted to give an RSI talk, and here I am. It's October, so my talk is, is sort, of, sort of dark. You know, October is a dark month, and people talk about scary things. I do talk a little bit about death and dying, so not, not scary, but that. I'm going to give a short presentation and then a short slideshow. Come on in. Seats up here, prime seating. <clears throat> I'll wait just a second. Okay. This year, this year I've passed the 20th anniversary since finishing medical school, and by now I'm about halfway through my career. I've had some time to reflect. Um, I started out as a physician scientist uh, trainee. I was really eager to cure cancer. I had been through RSI where I was uh, taught and convinced that I was um, capable of curing cancer and, and that uh, I had to strive to be excellent and to make a big impact in the world, and I think all of us agree with that. So uh, once I reached the lab and tried to cure cancer, I, d I did well, but I realized that it was going to be harder than it looked. So I decided to go and practice clinical medicine and go back to my hometown and uh, marry my high school sweetheart and have a family. I wound up specializing in hematology oncology because I thought that was where I could make the greatest impact and to cure some, some individuals with, with blood cancers. There are seats up here. So I was going to cure people one, one patient at a time. As an oncologist, uh, my perspective became different than other, other physicians, uh, for better or worse. I have a deeper appreciation for, um, for, uh, for death and dying than others do. As you probably know, cancer is commonly a terminal disease. It turns out we cure about 25% of all comers with different kinds of cancer. And 75% uh, of patients usually succumb to it, or 75% of patients will ultimately succumb to it. Looking back, there was no, form no formal training provided to me about how to handle death and dying. You just learned it on the job, and I think most of us learn it with personal ex uh, family and friends' experiences. I focused on leukemia and lymphoma uh, because those are the kinds of cancers that are most easily curable with the, the tools that we have. And, uh, but, you know, and I was very excited and eager to cure patients who are curable. Still, over my 20 years of practice, I've been involved with about 3,000 people who've died and about 200 who have what I would consider to be a premature or unexpected death. By now, I've, I've mastered the end-of-life discussion, how to explain to patients and families that they might lose their loved one or they might lose their life. And I, I warned you, th those of you who are here, I warned you this is not the happiest presentation, but I promise you're going to get something out of this and remember it. Um, by now, I've mastered that discussion, the end-of-life discussion. Over time, I've become more accustomed to the idea that some, some people die unexpectedly uh, or prematurely. None of us are are thrilled about that. Even though I'm used to handling this, when I see a young person uh, die of cancer, I get depressed, I lose sleep for several days or weeks, and I sometimes cry. I think to myself, this wasn't part of the job description that I heard about when I went to medical school, like dealing with quite a bit of death and dying. And um, I don't think that medical school prepared me for it. I don't think that I was screened when I got into medical school whether I could handle that kind of career. I just, it just happened. So here I am. I'm an expert at death and dying. Um, I think I'm a little colder than I was at one point, you know, deal dealing with it a little more indifferent because that's kind of a coping strategy. If I spend every, every week of every month not sleeping and, and crying, then you can't go to work. So <clears throat> in conclusion, after studying for years, after trying to cure cancer, after doing research, after ending up in a medical practice where I deal with a lot of death and dying, I've concluded that, that cancer just sucks. It just sucks. And I think many of you have personal experiences with it and your friends or family that you can relate to that. 
So by now I've made you about as sad about it as I am. And um, I'm going to show you a short slide presentation. I have just a few more minutes. And then I'll lift you back up at the end. I promise not to make you so sad, not to leave you so sad. So here we are, just to remind everybody that cancer is the second leading cause of death, the green line, about 600,000 deaths a year right behind heart disease, more or less tied these days with heart disease in the United States. 14 million people every, every year in the entire world are, are told they have cancer, 14 million. 13 million people in the United States are cancer survivors or living with it. 1.7 million new cases a year in the United States, 600,000 deaths. Lung cancer is by far the number one cancer killer of both men and women. Also prostate, colon, cancer, pancreatic cancer, blood cancers, breast cancer, things you hear people have and people succumb to. The body count for cancer is higher than anything else you can imagine. The body count, when you talk about young, productive people, people who contribute a lot to our society, people who didn't ask to get cancer, people who didn't do anything to themselves to get cancer, it just happens. It's a higher body count than terrorism, airplane crashes, natural disasters, wars. The, the world body count is unbelievable. 1.7 million people a year die of lung cancer in the world, and um, almost a million stomach cancer, colon cancer in the world. I'm going to show you some images, still on the sad note, um, doing this on purpose to make everybody remember this. So see if, see if you recognize some of these faces, some notable cancer victims, people that might have been on your radar when you were younger. They all left us too early. I've come to realize that the people who shape our world are not just the people who live in our world, but the people who came and went. Remember, John McCain, whether you like him or not, saved health care or saved Obamacare, and now he's gone. Remember, Steve Jobs changed everything. If you haven't had a chance, take a look at this online. Famously, 10 years ago, this is the 10th year anniversary, Randy Pausch, uh, computer science professor at University of Pittsburgh, Car at, or Carnegie Mellon, rather, um, uh, did a very uh, emotional and intense lecture for students. It was called The Last Lecture when he knew that he was going to die of pancreatic cancer. He died 10 months later. And you can read it or watch it. And um, he revealed at the end that the lecture was really for his kids. He said, if you live your life the right way, the karma will take care of itself. The dreams will come to you. This is the kind of thing you think about when you talk about death and dying and cancer patients. We lost my RSI counselor, named Scott, to cancer at, shortly after he did RSI. Um, some rickoids have had cancer and survived it. There are others who have succumbed to it. Many rickoids have family members and loved ones with cancer. Um, <clears throat> four years ago, I lost my mom to lung cancer. I married my high school sweetheart, and we're together, but cancer took my mom. When someone has cancer, there are three main questions. First, what caused it? Second, what do we do now? And the third question will be, how do I deal with this in the future? Or will I die of it? Set of questions related to the future. Cancer is known to be two-thirds random, just bad luck. It's known based on a lot of intense investigation, a lot of experts. Um, we can do some things to modify our risk. We can avoid smoking. We can tr try to avoid being very overweight. We can try to have a healthy diet. But no matter what you do, two-thirds of your cancer risk is, is out of your control. 25% of people with a cancer diagnosis are cured. 50% um, of people live with cancer and, and die of it. So you get cancer, you have all comers 50-50 chance of dying of cancer. And it depends on uh, uh, what kind of cancer and all that. 25% uh, of people live with cancer and die of something else. They outlive their cancer. I do not like cancer here or there. I do not like cancer anywhere. We try to cure the curable. We go for surgery where possible, talk about breast, lung, colon, prostate cancer, and cut it out if you can, and give chemo after, and try for, hope for the best to clean up whatever's there. Those who are not curable, which is about 75% of patients with a new cancer diagnosis, we do what's called palliative treatment. 
you hear about palliative treatment, that word has problems because we talk about people who are about to die getting palliation and palliative treatment. But in the cancer world, that, that means that we're going to hope to help you live better and longer. We talk about longevity and quality of life. And the best we can do would be to keep people alive for a full lifespan with cancer and hopefully not suffering. We do that sometimes, but not that often. Cancer was cured by surgery. President Nixon, heard about him in the last presentation, uh, right before Christmas on, in 1971, signed the uh, NC, uh, National Cancer Institute uh, bill, law. He said, the time has come in America when the same kind of concentrated effort that split the atom and took the man to, man to the moon should be turned toward conquering this dread disease. If you haven't had a chance, read the book by uh, Siddhartha Mukherjee, who was a Harvard uh, hematology oncology fellow. He wrote the book called The Emperor of All Maladies, Pulitzer Prize winning book about 10 years ago, Hist History of Cancer. Modern treatment for cancer includes chemotherapy and immunotherapy. They say laughter is the best medicine, but unless you have cancer, in which case chemotherapy is more effective than laughter. It's supposed to make you laugh. These are things that I cure. I'm focused on blood cancers. I cure people with APL leukemia. If I, if I have a patient with APL leukemia who doesn't get cured, because it's so likely they will be cured, if I lose one, I, I cry for weeks because it's something you're supposed to be cured of, and it tends to be young people with young children, and imagine the, dis the in disruption in people's lives when they lose their loved one to APL. CML leukemia, we have people doing very well, Hodgkin's disease. The diseases that you hear about being cured, sometimes um, large B-cell lymphoma were only about 60%. People with AML leukemia are cured only about 25% of the time. These are some of the tools that we've uh, acquired the past five years. New drugs, just different drug names. Maybe some of you have heard of them if you have a loved one with lymphoma. These drug names include things that are considered to be immunotherapy. Immunotherapy is the holy grail we've been trying for 100 years to get immunotherapy, to get your immune system to attack the cancer. And finally, you may be hearing about these drugs if for no other reason maybe you've invested in them. Um, Optivo and Keytruda are, the, are two of the four immunotherapy drugs that enable the immune system to recognize cancer. And in the news, famously, is the thing called CAR-T. I could give a whole presentation on CAR-T, but I'll give you 10 seconds on it because I'm about out of time. CAR-T is where you collect the body's T cells and teach them to recognize the cancer by giving them an antibody that targets the cancer. So you then grow those T cells in a lab and send them back to the patient and, and reinfuse them. The blue is reinfusing. And by doing that, you taught the patient's immune system to fight the cancer. And uh, we're finding that it's actually able to cure some people. This shows curing. So CAR T is on the horizon, but still very, very new and not ready for everybody yet. Cancer has become a chronic disease. If you're not cured of it, then you must live with it. Um, it's a continuous treatment model. Your idea would be like diabetes. Instead of getting insulin, you're getting chemo all the time or immunotherapy and hopefully live a long life. We talk about palliative care, meaning living a long <coughs> life, not necessarily dying of cancer, but hopefully a longer, better life and hopefully a normal lifespan. We finally did bend the curve. And over the past 10 years, it's got to the point where we see fewer people dying of cancer than, uh, than did before, or you know, relatively speaking. So we're getting somewhere, but, and we're doing our best. We're fighting. Don't forget, this is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Cancer still sucks. Thankfully, several of us and other Rickoids are working on fighting it. That's my son, Michael. He did RSI last summer. <laughs> <laughs> He's not actually here. He had to go to a meeting, but uh, I'll let him know that I showed a picture of him. <laughs> I'll take questions about cancer. Yeah. I've always been curious, is, is it cancer really one disease or is it many diseases? I mean, uh, we talk about breast cancer versus brain cancer, whatever, to, as those are the obviously the organs from which they started. But are they the same disease or are they different? That's the big challenge. The question is, is cancer multiple diseases? It's, it's multiple diseases so much to the point where each individual person with cancer has his or her own disease. So it's more or less a million different diseases. On the other hand, there's, uh, there are features that are common. For example, there are now known to be a limited number of common mutations that occur in each different type of cancer. And we're getting to the point where we can find those common mutations and do what's called now being called personalized medicine. And, you know, we... 
th thankfully have new drugs coming along that specifically target mutations that are common and ultimately that will direct the kinds of treatments that we that we do provide but yeah it's so hard because it's different diseases yeah Cancer cells in general, about how they're like selectively used glucose as a fuel source or glutamine. For example, are there specific drugs on the market right now that target those specific aspects of cancer rather than going after, say, a particular variety of uh, neoplasm, for example? There are targeted drugs that are more or less focused on what mutations are identified within the cells. And it's funny you mentioned glucose because one of the leukemia drugs is um, isocitrate dehydrogenase inhibitor type drug. And that's something that would be a target for, for, cells, for uh, uh, glycolysis pathway. But the use of that type of drug would be based on having the mutation, not necessarily based on finding a, a pattern of glucose utilization. Uh, uh, yeah. Is there a correlation between the cause of the cancer and how likely it is to survive? The question is, is there a correlation to the cause of cancer and how likely you are to survive? I'll give you one example that comes to mind quick because we don't have a lot of time. But there are probably multiple ways to look at that question. And the easiest one is that lung cancer patients who never smoked cigarettes have a different kind of lung cancer. And you can imagine that it would be you know, unlikely that it was caused by toxins because the main toxin they didn't have, the main toxin we know to be associated with lung cancer. So in those patients, uh, we see lung cancer patients who never smoked go on for a long time, and we know that the treatments uh, work, work differently for those patients. And you can see that it's just a different disease. So the point is that the cause of cancer probably has a little bit to do with, with, um, with what kind of cancer uh, trajectory they have. Uh, one more question. Yeah. TB, you know, somehow we cure it, right? Yes, we can cure TB patients, yeah. Is there an if and when in cancer? Are we going to cure cancer? So far, the trajectory for cancer is that we're going to help people live better and longer. And it looks like we've more or less plateaued at about 25% of all comers with cancer being cured the way we think of cure. So that plateau, maybe one day will change, but it doesn't look like that's happening anytime soon. Instead, people are just living better and longer even though they're not cured. Thank you for listening to me. It's a nice audience.